these were tumultuous times. These were tremendously, right? The Chinese curse, uh, I mean, you live in interesting times, which apparently is not real, apparently, uh, but we'll still use it for literary reasons. Um, may you live in interesting times. Israeli history, modern Israeli history is tremendously interesting. And our point, if you remember, is Israeli voter turnout. Israeli voter turnout never dropped below 77%, even with 1,000% inflation that debased the currency, even with the unbelievably important um, shift from a labor party-led government in 77 for the very first time to the opposition, which came to power and we turned out that we really were a democracy the whole time. Uh, war after war, resignation, assassination, a generational change in Israeli politics, and voter turnout, which is a signal of voter uh, faith, of, 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 the, of the public's faith in, in the political process to solve their problems, to address their problems, to express their problems. Voter turnout never dropped below the minimum of 77%. 18 months passed between the election of 1999 and the election of 2001. 18 months of the Barack government. When the Barack government falls in 2001, we have another election. And voter turnout, for the first time in Israeli history, collapses 15 points from the 78, I'm sorry, 16 points from the 78% of 1999 to 62%. We have risen a bit. Uh, the, by the way, the next election was 64%, I believe. Um, people wrote it off at the time as due to a slight change in how our elections work. You used to only vote for a party list. Now you had two notes, two, two choices to make a party list and a prime minister is the direct election of a prime minister. But it wasn't the first time there was a direct election of prime minister. That was true in 96 as well. Um, and in 99, when voter turnout was still 77%. It wasn't the direct election of the prime minister that changed voter turnout, that collapsed voter turnout. We lost 16% of the electorate in one blow. We still have not recovered to the minimum we were 20 years ago. And not only have we not recovered, since that time, Israeli voters have been voting in ridiculous ways. You should always be very, very uh, suspicious of, of a political pundit who tries to argue that the voter is ridiculous because what it means is that I don't understand the voter. But what I, what I mean when I say that the Israeli voters started voting in ridiculous ways is that voters told us that they were voting in ridiculous ways. Voters shifted wildly between parties. We had Benjamin Netanyahu led the Likud party in the 2006 election to 12 seats in the Knesset out of 120, 10% of parliament. Benjamin Netanyahu, in the last election, led the Likud party. Wow, I don't even remember. Uh, what is it, 36 seats? 38 seats? 32 seats? 35 seats? Multiple elections in a row that all delivered three times what Likud had just 14 years ago. And in between had various numbers as well. We had a party called Yeshatid that took 19 seats in the first time it ever ran. It took a sixth of parliament the first time it ever ran. We had a party called Kadima that in one election wins 28 seats, a quarter of parliament, and in the following election wins two. A quarter of the electorate evaporates in one party's terms and goes somewhere else. Voters became unmoored, detached. They started moving around in ways we'd never seen before in Israeli politics. And 15 to 16 to sometimes you know, 18 and, 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 and sometimes just 10, but nevertheless, a double digit percentage of the electorate just walked away from the political process. What happened? And that's our subject today. Not only what happened, but how profoundly it changed Israel from the Israel that American Jews are still arguing about over in America, and that the, the political left in Europe is still arguing about in Brussels and in London and in Paris and in Berlin to a very different Israel and a very different Israeli conversation that we're having in Israel today in Hebrew. What happened between 1999 and 2001 that cracked Israeli politics, that, that transformed a politics that was very easy to convey, there was a left and a right, to a politics that's very, very hard to describe today. What happened in a word, or in two words, was the second intifada. The second intifada, very quickly, what was it? Um, and, th and then why it had such a profound effect, and then I'm going to wind down and we'll open this up to, to, uh, to questions and answers and 
and, and a conversation. Aviv, do you mind if I jump in really quick? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I've been told that apparently we just went live on Facebook a couple minutes ago. Um, so we apologize for people who uh, were tuning in on Facebook, but we should be live now. So um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this talk, um, feel free to type in your questions if you're on Zoom in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And if you are watching on Facebook, feel free to write questions in the comment section there and we will try our best to get to them. So sorry about that, Habib, as you were. No, no, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, one sentence uh, summary for the people on Facebook, my apologies that uh, I can't give you the whole story again. Um, uh, voter turnout in Israel was tremendously high, 77 to 82% uh, in that range for the entire tumultuous, traumatic, complex history of Israel with wars and, 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 and assassinations and turnovers of government and, and financial collapses and the whole business. And then suddenly between 1999 and 2001, voter turnout collapsed in, those, in that 18 month window of the Barack government of 1999 to 2001, what happened? And the answer is the second intifada. Now, what the second intifada actually was in the Israeli experience, now folks, there's many narratives about the second intifada, happy to get into that in a minute in the Q&A. Um, the, the mainstream Israeli experience of the second intifada was this relentless wave of suicide bombings bloody, spectacular in the sense that they were a, a spectacle in the middle of our cities, targeting civilians, targeting children often, um, of 140 of these bombings. And it came just at this Barack government period of 1999 to 2000. It begins in the fall of 2000. Uh, when Barack and Arafat, the Palestinian leader, are at Camp David with Bill Clinton, ostensibly what Israelis understood, what we were told by, uh, by our government and, the, and, and the, the Americans and the Palestinian government to a large extent, um, was that they were negotiating the peace, the final peace, the peace that would deliver a two-state solution that would be you know, massively backed and funded by the United States, that gave the Palestinians their independence from us, uh, and they were negotiating that. It was at the height of the peace process. Begins this wave of relentless bombings. That wave of bombings destroyed, in an important sense, Israeli politics, at least as we had known it. And what do I mean by that? There used to be a narrative of the Israeli left. The Israeli left used to tell a very, very specific narrative about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It went something like this. And this is the Israeli left from the first intifada on. If anybody here knows much about the first intifada, I'm going to just run through it in two sentences. You know, please read a book about it, even Wikipedia. There's a great deal of information out there, obviously many perspectives. The first intifada begins in 1987. It begins from a car accident in Gaza, a military truck and a Palestinian civilian vehicle, and there are Palestinians who are killed. The, the accident itself is the spark. The accident is not the reason. But what happens is it sparks an, a, 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 a really a very a, a popular uprising in the sense that it sparks these massive protests throughout the Palestinian population centers in the West Bank uh, that begin bottom up. And there are Palestinian political movements and terror groups that try to take over as sort of to define what this intifada is about. Now, the first intifada had many, many phenomena, terror attacks, just outright, you know, attacks on civilians, um, uh, all kinds of different kinds of violence, uh, many, many different things. But there is a, 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 for Israelis, for the Israeli memory and experience of the first intifada, there is one major, major experience that we call the children of the stones. The children of the stones were these protests by Palestinian children, uh, 13 years old, sometimes 11, sometimes nine. Uh, who would face our soldiers. Now, in 1987, the Israeli military presence in the West Bank ran Palestinian population centers. The soldiers were inside Palestinian cities. A Palestinian school child would go from, from home to, to, to school in the morning in Jenin, and the, the, the armed person running traffic on the way to school was somebody else's army. It was a very, very close presence. The rock throwing protest by these children becomes a story on our nightly news in the, in the late 80s. Our army, unlike the American army or the British army, when our army deploys somewhere, it, it deploys you know, a 45 minute bus ride from home. Our army doesn't deploy to Afghanistan. Our army doesn't deploy to Iraq. 
Um, and, and those soldiers who suddenly face those kids, Israeli infantry, trained to face the Syrian commando fortifications on the road to Damascus if, if the need should arise. Those infantry battalions and brigades that were now standing in front of children throwing rocks had no answer to, the, to, that, to that experience, to that moment, to that moral challenge. What do you do with an M16 facing kids? We had on our nightly news images of soldiers, our big, tough, strong soldiers running away. <laughs> literally running away from, from the, because what are they going to do? And, or soldiers who would run down an alley chasing a kid who had thrown a rock. What that soldier is thinking, and sometimes they'd be interviewed afterwards, and they would say on the news, uh, you know, they're thinking to themselves, geez, I hope I don't catch this kid. What the heck am I supposed to do with them? 1987, the first intifada was experienced by Israelis as the beginning of a, of a fundamental shift that created a new Israeli left, and an Israeli left that had a very simple narrative. Those soldiers all went home. They went home that weekend. Our army goes home on the weekend. And they went home to their mother's Shabbat dinner table for that Friday night, and they sat at that dinner table, and they told their mothers, those soldiers, what they had experienced. And Israel's mothers, and I use mothers not because it's an interesting image, but because it, it had a motherly component in the actual political reality, understood the predicament of the Israeli military presence in the Palestinian population centers, of, of occupation, of belligerent occupation in these areas where other people live, understood the problem faster than the brigadier generals. And it created a new Israeli left. And the Israeli left had the following narrative, and it's a narrative that any, anyone overseas who's in any way has even a dim sense of this conflict uh, will recognize. The narrative said something like this. I, Israel, control the West Bank with my military. The Palestinians living in the West Bank are under my military rule. They don't elect the Israeli military governor of the West Bank. The operation, the, the uh, uh, theater commander of the Central Command is the legal sovereign of the West Bank under Israeli law. They don't elect him. They're under military occupation. Whether the land is under military occupation is a big debate in Israeli politics. That's not relevant to our discussion here. The people unquestionably are not electing the person who ultimately is the legal sovereign in the area. I owe them that. That is a moral debt I have to them. Their independence from me. I owe them to be free of me. The Israeli left said in the 80s and in the 90s. I'm not a nice guy for saying, hey, the Palestinians should really have their freedom and their state and separation from me. That's fundamental, something that I owe them. And then the Israeli left made a promise to Israelis. And the promise was the campaign of Yitzhak Rabin in 1982. It won the 92 election. It again won the 1999 election for Ehud Barak. It was a dominating force in Israeli politics throughout the 90s that started the Oslo peace process. And the promise went like this. If I give the Palestinians their freedom from me, which I owe them anyway, which is, which is no great sacrifice on my part. If I give it to them, they will give me the only thing I want from them. The only thing that Israel wants from them in this narrative, some people call it peace. Some people call it security. In the Israeli terms of reference, those are not different things. Really, what I want from them is to be left alone. I want a border, and I want that to be them and this to be me. And I'd love to be, you know, to do trade and tourism, but I don't want to control them. I want to separate. They'll give me peace, security, separation. Then came the second intifada. Now, folks, in 1987, the Israeli army was in deep, deep inside the Palestinian cities. But through the 90s, the Palestinian Authority was established. The Oslo II Agreement in, in 1995 establishes the Palestinian Authority. There are no Israeli soldiers in any Palestinian city by 2000. This is a difficult thing to understand from outside. It is a fundamental reality so obvious to Israelis they don't talk about it. Today in 2020, the peace process is uh, 28 years old. It's obvious to us, it's, it's, it's axiomatic to us that the peace process is a failure. But in the year 2000, the peace process is exactly eight years old. 
And in those eight years, the Israeli military has left every Palestinian population center. There is a Palestinian quasi-state. It has its own security services. It runs its own life. And the world is pumping billions into its economy. And everybody's at Camp David talking about the state that's coming. In other words, in the Israeli mind, the peace process wasn't delayed. We all today sort of snicker at the peace process, but at the time, Israelis genuinely believed that was the direction. They don't know today, you ask Israelis, why did the second intifada come from? What justified, right? The Palestinians said at the time that Barak didn't offer enough at Camp David, as though the answer to didn't offer enough is 140 suicide bombings targeting your kids. Do this little mental exercise in your head about your own countries, whatever your country is. Take a population that for all the tragic complexities that are human societies is for some reason, even though population shouldn't be, but nevertheless is a politically divisive question. Immigrants in the United States, for example. Imagine immigrants in the United States. Imagine one immigrant from Latin America walking into a non-alcoholic bar in the city of St. Louis and blowing themselves up and killing 24 kids, a bar for teenagers, so it's non-alcoholic. That's what happened in Tel Aviv in 2001 at the Dolphinarium bombing. My question here again, just like, you know, is think about the politics. We're discussing politics today, not American immigration. And by the way, that has not happened in America. So I'm not making a comment about America. I'm trying to make a comment about driving home the scale of the political fallout in the Israeli psyche. I don't really want to know what Donald Trump tweets after a Mexican immigrant blows up children in America. That's not interesting to me because it's predictable. What do the progressives tweet? How does that look like? What is that discourse? I know what the progressives will tweet if, the, if a bombing like that happens in America. They'll say this Mexican immigrant is not a Mexican immigrant, a mass murderer, has nothing to do with immigration. Even if the bombing was because of Donald Trump's immigration policies, this one mass murderer doesn't mean that the 20 million people suffering in America because of an uncertain immigration policy no longer need our help, no longer need a better policy. He doesn't represent them. That's what they'll say. And they'll be right. They'll be completely right. And now I want you to imagine a week later, two more. Now what did the progressives say? What's the discourse sound like? And the week after that, three more. And the following month, 13 more bombings. And the week after that, another five. And another two after that. And the week after that, one more. This endless, over three, four years, 140 of these bombings. And I want you to begin to imagine the scale of political disruption. Israelis to this day, 20 years out, no one else outside of Israel's borders talks about the Second Intifada. Israeli politics inside Israel's borders are still living in the shadow of the scale of that mistake. At some point, those progressives in America will themselves want to build the wall just to stop the bombings that are undermining their ability to take care of any of that issue, to even deal with that issue, as the Israeli left did in, in Israel. All the comparisons I just made are terrible. Please don't take any of them seriously. The only point I think is valid is how massive political violence can change perception and change it in ways that the people committing the terror attacks Ne don't necessarily predict or understand. I don't think that what actually happened to Israelis is what the Hamas bombers wanted to happen. The Israeli left hasn't won an election in Israel since 1999. The Labour Party that Ehud Barak rode to the Prime Minister's office in 1999 has all but disappeared. There are three members of Knesset left, and in the polls now they don't enter the Knesset at all. And, and that decline has been very steady over the last 20 years. And now I want to say something a little bit more complicated, and I want to say it in three minutes. <laughs> the Israeli right also collapsed. And you're saying the Israeli right keeps winning elections. How come it collapsed? The Israeli right collapsed because it also had a narrative. And the narrative said something along these lines. You foreigners, all you people from overseas, 
You don't care about Palestinians. Folks, this is not me saying it. This is me trying to present a very simplified version of what the Israeli right, political right, was telling Israelis in Hebrew 25 years ago. Just to clarify, you foreigners don't really care about Palestinians. You don't. I'll prove it to you. Palestinians are suffering terribly in Lebanon and in Syria. A majority of the Jordanian population is Palestinian, yet Jordan is not a Palestinian state. It's even historic Palestine if you go back to. The Israeli political right said, why do you, are you okay with Palestinians suffering everywhere in the world? You don't even notice it. You don't even care. Palestinians literally can't own land in Lebanon by law. But you don't care, but, but you care very deeply when something happens to Palestinians here. There is a state in the world today that has a majority population of Palestinians. It's called Jordan. This, the Israeli right talked about the Jordan option throughout the 80s and into the 90s. It's historic Palestine. The only reason it's not a Palestinian state is because it's a dictatorship. And yet you foreigners don't mind. In other words, you're not interested really in Palestinian freedom. You're interested in Jews and you're interested in Jews doing bad things. You're all a bunch of anti-Semites. I'm not talking to the people on this call, please don't be offended. If I pull out of the West Bank, as the world is demanding for me, I shrink down to nine miles wide at the middle. I ask you in your country, wherever you live, it could be Belgium, it could be Canada, it can be all the vastness of Russia and Australia. What would you do to not shrink down to nine miles wide right in the middle of your country especially if the people around you are the people who are around us. The governments of Syria, the governments of Iran and Iraq, the, 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 the regimes that we face. Would you shrink down to nine miles wide in the middle because the world demanded it? The Israeli right argued, I can't shrink down to nine miles wide in the middle. And if the Palestinians should have freedom, they should have freedom in Jordan. And if the world really cared about Palestinians, that's what the world would, would pursue and not demand from me a suicidal withdrawal to the, to, to, to the pre-1967 ceasefire line that leaves me nine miles wide in the middle. That was the Israeli right story. In the first intifada and then in the second intifada, that right-wing story lost its convincing power among Israelis because Palestinians showed us, I don't have time to get deep into it, but I just in really in two sentences, Palestinians demonstrated to Israelis in ways that um, drew tremendous Israeli sympathy in the first intifada in ways that horrified Israelis and destroyed their capacity to ever really believe in Palestinian politics again, at least so far. But at both those instances, in the first and second intifada, which even though they have the same name is, to Israelis were opposite experiences, in both of those instances, Israeli right-wingers concluded that Palestinians actually are telling us not only that they can't be free anywhere else, but there. It has a lot to do with the connection to Jerusalem, to Al-Aqsa, which is their sort of, their seed, their, their, their source of dignity in all the lands of Islam. They're a symbol for, for Arab weakness in much of the Arab world, which has a lot to do with the anti-Semitism numbers in the Arab world. And Al-Aqsa gives them that symbol of, of, of non-weakness, of, of sanctity. And, and to give that up with the withdrawal from the West Bank with Israeli control of the West Bank and of Jerusalem uh, is something that, that they are willing to, we learn from them that they're willing to commit personal suicide um, to not have to, uh, you know, to not live with that, but also they're willing to commit national suicide. We've seen Hamas's control of Gaza, Hamas's devastation of Gaza as that lesson. I'm gonna wind up. I'm gonna wind up with um, the following statement and just one little corollary. The Israeli left collapsed. Israelis no longer believe that Palestinian politics, for whatever dysfunctions, for whatever problems, Palestinian politics internally or deeply divided, can deliver for us peace, or can deliver for us security, or can deliver for us leaving us the hell alone, however you define it. It can't deliver. Every time we withdraw from somewhere, and we've withdrawn from four-fifths and even more of the land we actually conquered in 1967, that vacuum that we leave behind is not filled by Jeffersonian Democrats. That vacuum is filled by bad guys. We pulled out of Gaza in 2005. 
there was a, a center, you know, the, the left collapsed, the right collapsed. In 2006, in 2005, Ariel Sharon um, carried out, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon carried out the disengagement from Gaza. He was the first prime minister after the second intifada, after the collapse of the left and the right. He had a new narrative. He said to Israelis, look, the left is right. We can't control the Palestinians. We have to get the hell out of there. The right is right. It, they won't give us peace, even if we get the hell out of there. So there's a simple answer. We pull out because it's in our interest to separate. And we set a border. In the case of Gaza, it's the internationally recognized green line. And if anyone tries to cross that border to attack us, we shoot them. It's a border. They're an enemy, right? Makes sense. It's certainly the most moral option left open to us after the second intifada. Ariel Sharon carries out the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. He has a stroke in December 2005. He had left, he carried out the, uh, the uh, withdrawal as the head of the Likud party. He then has a, he founds a separate Kadima party, a new party, and then he has a stroke and he's sort of taken off of, out of Israeli politics and his replacement as the head of Kadima, a man named Eud Olmert, then runs in the 2006 election. And two weeks before election day, Eud Olmert delivers the following promise. He says to Israelis, my fellow Israelis, it's a speech two weeks before an election. It's a campaign speech. He says, I am going to pull out of the West Bank. He called it the Hitkansut, uh, the ingathering plan, the disengagement plan, the ingathering plan. Israeli politicians don't like to use the word withdrawal. I am going to pull out of 90% of the West Bank or even more. If you vote for me, don't tell me I didn't tell you. He literally said that. And if you, and, and, um, uh, if you vote for me, don't tell me I didn't tell you. Ehud Olmert wins that election. The question of a West Bank withdrawal several months after the Gaza withdrawal is the only question the election is about. In 2006, 14 years ago, Israelis voted for a withdrawal from the West Bank. He forms a government in March, a government with a labor party that can no longer win elections in the defense ministry to carry out the withdrawal. And in June of 2006, three months after he forms a government, uh, Hamas in Gaza carries out the very first attack across the border, the tunnel attack that uh, they pop out on the Israeli side. They killed two Israeli soldiers. They kidnap a third. His name is Gilad Shalit. There is now a shooting, uh, you know, shooting war in Gaza. And, uh, and uh, in mid-July, uh, a month into that tension on the Gaza border, that fighting in Gaza, uh, Hezbollah, six years after Israel pulled out of South Lebanon after an 18-year presence there unilaterally, Hezbollah. Uh, kidnaps and kills Israeli soldiers on that border, and the Second Lebanon War is underway. During the Second Lebanon War, thousands of rockets fell on Israeli cities from Gaza and from Lebanon. Uh, and even though Eud Olmert bombed, conducted very, very severe bombing raids um, and, 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 and really tried to crush uh, Hezbollah's capabilities, um, every bridge in Lebanon was blown up in that war. Half of Beirut lost electricity during that war. Ehud Olmert was elected to pull out of the West Bank. And the two places from which Israel had just pulled out had just launched a war in which they could completely uh, freeze and decimate Israeli civilian life through these constant rocket barrages. Ehud Olmert had to show Israelis that he could deter rocket barrages, not from Lebanon and Gaza, but from the West Bank. The center that now argued, you know, the left collapsed because they won't give us peace for withdrawal, and the right collapsed because we can't just control them forever. A new center was born that said, we can just withdraw and shoot anyone who comes over the border. That collapsed when it turned out we actually can't deter them from firing at our cities. 300,000 Israelis were displaced, were literally had to flee their homes for the entire month of that summer war. We can't deter Hezbollah and Hamas from launching rockets at us by bombing Lebanon and Gaza. It turns out that Hezbollah and Hamas don't care how much we bomb Lebanon and Gaza. I don't think Israelis are especially humanitarian and care deeply about what happens to the other side in a war, but Hamas and Hezbollah care even less. Is the Israeli public feeling? Ehud Olmert could never carry out that West Bank withdrawal. The West Bank, folks, is 16 times the size of Gaza. It is the highlands that overlook all our major population centers. Israeli politics has been consumed with the question of withdrawal. 
And the people who wanted to withdraw won election after election after election as recently as 2006. And at every step of the way, every narrative that arose inside Israeli politics to the point uh, uh, collapsed, collapsed against the reality of our politics, but mostly the reality of the other side's politics. We don't know what to do. If you now quiz Israelis on an open-ended question, what do you actually want to happen? Most of them will tell you, I want to separate from the Palestinians. How does that happen? What does that look like? How do we actually carry it out? Very, very few Israelis think they have an answer. Welcome to Israel. I don't argue that Israelis are correct. I don't argue that their, their narrative is, is objective truth. I, I don't know the objective truth. But they don't feel, they don't feel justified. They don't feel like sometimes defenders of Israel have these passionate arguments about how right we are. We're pretty sure that our military shouldn't be in charge of someone else's civilian population. We're pretty sure that we really want to end it. We're pretty sure we have no idea how, and we're pretty sure that every previous attempt ended in rivers of blood. I don't want the world to give us, you know, uh, to exonerate us, to give us a free, you know, ride. There's serious problems in this conflict. Everyone should have an opinion, fantastic. But don't have an opinion that turns us into cartoons. We're deeply, deeply confused. And that confusion comes from decades of serious thinking and, and, and the failure of, 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 of all of our previous attempts. I'm going to stop there. There's a lot of complexity. There's many Palestinian narratives uh, to everything I just said. Um, and, uh, and there are many issues that bring it right up to the present day, questions of annexation, uh, questions of uh, politics in Israel, elections, Netanyahu. I said the Israeli right is weakened and the Israeli right collapsed. That was true really until the last three or four years when the Israeli right has come back uh, in a powerful way, arguing that we should now make a serious uh, change to our West Bank policy. We've, we've not withdrawn, but also not annexed for 53 years. And a lot of the Israeli right now argues, no, no, we actually should annex the part that we hope to keep someday. We should stop waiting for the Palestinians to ever be in a mood to make peace or politically capable of making peace. Um, uh, the Israeli right, I don't think that the call for annexation, we have wonderful polling on this. The call to annex the West Bank is still not a majority view uh, in the Israeli political scene, but there isn't a good um, counter argument. And there isn't a good counter argument to annexation for a very simple reason. We have good polling of the West Bank. If I pull out of the West Bank today, I Israel, not I Chaviv, I have not expressed my own views in this conversation, but the views of, a main, of the mainstream of Israelis, um, if I, Israel, pulls out of the West Bank today, the vacuum filled, the vacuum I leave behind will be filled by Hamas. We have excellent polling by Palestinian pollsters, by Gallup, by Israeli pollsters. Everyone polls Israelis and Palestinians. We're some of the most polled people in the world. And those polls tell us that Hamas wins an election in the West Bank today. That's why Mahmoud Abbas is in the 14th, I think, year of a four-year term. He won't call elections because he'll lose those elections to Hamas. In other words, Mahmoud Abbas, has the same view on me as, as me, the Israeli, for why I can't withdraw from the West Bank at the moment. If the West Bank goes the way of Gaza, I can't leave it that way. I, I can't put a blockade as we did in 2007 with the Hamas takeover of Gaza. I, I, I can't just sort of clamp down. I'll have to retake the West Bank, as I did in the Second Intifada. Uh, after the Second Intifada was, was ended when Israel essentially just launched a military invasion and ended the Oslo process at the time, uh, it then everything was restored when the violence died down, but the Israeli army literally just crushed the second Intifada on the ground. A reconquest of the West Bank is bloodier than not withdrawing. I'm not arguing to stay forever in the West Bank. I'm arguing that in the Israeli view, there are no good options. And those who easily sort of throw away, oh, pull out of the West Bank, if that brings a Hamas rocket right, uh, uh, you know, state with, with uh, arsenals of 100,000 rockets in the West Bank, where we're nine miles wide in the middle and it overlooks Tel Aviv and our major international airports in Jerusalem and Haifa, and that leads to future wars in the West Bank, then that Israeli withdrawal will bring terrible suffering on the Palestinians greater than what there is today.
there are no good options. And there's no good argument from the left because there isn't a sense that there's a good option from the Palestinian side to allow us to withdraw. I'm gonna stop there. I hope I conveyed to you uh, the deep confusion Israelis feel. If you are deeply frustrated and worried and confused, welcome to Israeli politics today. Wow, thank you, Haviv. Um, I think I speak for everybody here when I say thank you for that. That's extremely informative. Uh, from my point of view, at least, and I'm sure from everybody else's point of view here, it's always great to hear about topics that are this complicated, this complex, this sensitive from somebody who spends lots of time studying it and who is clearly an expert on it. So thank you. Um, and I think you did a very good job of obviously not advocating for one side or another, but of humanizing Israelis and Israeli society and showing their perspective and their story and what they've gone through, their, their trials and errors. Um, and it's a topic that isn't really uh, talked about a lot. You know, the, the media is constantly talking about, you know, Israeli right-wing power grabs and, you know, powerful Israelis belligerently occupying weak Palestinians. And there isn't a lot of depth analyzing the Israeli perspective. So uh, I thank you for providing us with a very good analysis of that. Um, and especially talking about the second intifada, I can't imagine what it would be like to live through events like that as an Israeli. Um, just something that I'm wondering about personally before I, I dive into audience questions here is, you know, as, as an American, I noticed there is a lot of disconnect, some disconnect. I don't want to generalize too much, but in some areas of America and some areas of American Jewry, especially amongst young American Jews, there's a disconnect between their political views about Israel and Israelis' political views for the future. I don't know if um, you have any insight or opinion or want to comment a bit on what causes that disconnect, maybe ways that that disconnect could be bridged. Yeah. Um... <laughs> It's complicated. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I I argue that the 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 whole chattering classes around the world that love to talk about my my people, my country, my experience, uh, don't understand me. Uh, so I'm a little bit worried. Uh, I'm still going to do it because I'm a journalist. So what the heck? I get to have an opinion. I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm a little bit worried. You should take with a grain of salt anything I say about American Jews, um, even though I. I did go to middle school and high school in the United States, and so I have this accent, but I, 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 uh, I uh, am not, in fact, an American Jew. I was born in Jerusalem. I, I, I spent most of my life in Jerusalem. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. That, that I take very seriously the American Jewish progressive or even just, you know, sort of liberal Democrat uh, perspective on Israel, the anxiety. I take it very, very seriously. The American Jewish story in the American Jewish frame of the American Jewish story is, is, is as redemptive as the Zionist story. It, 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 Zionism predicted is an analysis of modernization that says that modernizing societies, even though they have parliaments and they look modern and liberal, in fact have in them, because they create these mass societies, imagined societies, everybody has to imagine themselves to be the same German and the same Frenchman and the same Pole. Therefore, inside themselves, people who don't fit the imagined community, not just Jews, Roma, and various other minorities, are in real danger. Zionism, Herzl argued in you know 1897, and so they better get the heck out and build their own mass society. And then Herzl, I promise I'm going to answer, but I'm young American Jews. And then Herzl writes a book right before his death called Alt Neuland, which is this um, this uh, um, utopian vision of what the Jewish state will look like way in the future of, I think, 1926, when he visits his, in his imagined, of course, he died in 1904, when he visits this imagined Jewish state. And there is a political crisis in that Jewish state. The dramatic tension in Alt Neuland is that there is a mean rabbi who wants to rob the Arabs of their rights, and the Jews have to vote to not take rights away from the Arabs. In other words, Herzl thought that Zionism is a theory about modernization and the Jews are as susceptible to this, um, to this uh, difficulty in, in tolerating minorities 
as anyone else. And so the answer is for everyone to have self-determination. And that's the, that's the way to get to peace. And that's the way to get to an end to the Jewish condition of constant oppression. I say all of that to say that um, Zionism worked. Zionism's warning was true across the world, across Asia, Africa, and Europe. Those are continents that emptied of millennia old Jewish communities into Hebrew speaking Israel. The only exception, the biggest exception at least, uh, is, uh, is France. French Jewry is about half a million Jews, but the vast majority of them fled North Africa in the 60s. In other words, it's the exception that proves the rule. Jews had to flee. And that's who fought, founded Israel, refugees. American Jews, and more broadly, English-speaking Jews, British, Canadian, Australian, they're the only place where the Zionist prediction never came true. They land in America. There's this letter from Washington, George Washington, to the uh, congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, where he says, I refuse to tolerate you Jews because I refuse the very concept, the very principle that you need me to tolerate you. You're Americans and I'm American. We're all Americans. I don't tolerate you. There's no such thing as tolerance. The fact that, I, that the idea that you think I should tolerate you is insulting to me because it means that you think that I don't really believe in our constitution and our ideals. That's a foundational document for the Jewish experience. Jews fought mostly, almost entirely for the Union Army. Some of them were new German speaking Jews who had just arrived and they fought in German speaking brigades uh, in the Union Army in the Civil War. They loved Lincoln um, and uh, they, uh, they go on to be major, major players in the civil rights movement. Uh, and uh, you know the, the, the 1964 um, uh, civil rights bill was written, the first draft was written in the Religious Action Center of the Reform Movement in Washington. Um, the, the Jews were the most, and today Jews vote almost, almost exactly the way African Americans vote. And that's a, that's, that's a century of history. That's not today, it's not Trump, and it's not Obama, and it's not a specific moment. It's a century of history. And the reason the Jews are liberal Americans, even Republican Jews are the 10, 10 by I think large majority of them to be the liberal end of the Republican Party is because they view America and the promise of America as a place that didn't have a national identity in the sense that nation is meant, you know, ethnic identity in the sense that the word nation or ethnos is, is meant in Europe and in the Middle East. Americans are a nation founded on an idea and they're radically individualist. They got that from the early Protestant founders. And so Jews could really belong in America. And so American Jews view American liberalism as their homeland, not just America per se, but American liberalism, American individualism, American acceptance as a kind of redemption from history. They didn't go through the 20th century. They didn't go through the Holocaust. They didn't go through the expulsion of Baghdad, which left not one Jew in Baghdad by the 60s or by the 70s. Um, they didn't go through the just complete cleansing of whole nations and whole continents of Jews that is the story of the Israeli Jews. And so when Americans, Jews from the hundred years of that history come to Israel today and say to Israel, if you don't behave morally, you undermine everything. Uh, 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 you know, life, survival. Um, you, you're, Israel is only worth having, Peter Beinart argues, if Israel is moral, if it behaves morally. And if it doesn't behave morally, it's not worth having. Now, Israelis are very insulted by that. Go to Russia and tell the Russians that Russia is only worth existing if Russia behaves morally. Go to the French and tell the French, hey, you don't get France unless France behaves well. I know Israel misbehaves. To tell me Israel misbehaves on, you know, I get a lot of tweets by people who are angry at Israel for something. Um, folks, if I tell an American that America has done something wrong, they're not going to fall off their chair. Uh, I, I know Israel misbehaves. I'm Israeli. I, I know ways that Israel misbehaves that most people have never heard of. Every Israeli does. Every American knows such things about America and are bothered by things in America. But the argument that Israel, if it isn't moral, cannot survive or maybe even should not survive, which is an argument heard on, heard on the progressive American left, is, is rooted in a deep, deep experience of 100 years of that sense of liberal morality literally being, not literally, but in profound way, being the, 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 the homeland in which American Jews found their, their end to diasporic you know, dependence and fragility. Um, uh, and, and, and that is their answer to the same 
crisis that Zionism answered by building a state. So I take it really, really very, very seriously. And when they come to me and talk to me about morality, and when they talk to me about occupation, and when they talk to me about equality, and when they talk to me about uh, you know, what it feels like to be a minority in Israel, the first thing I do is listen very, very carefully. The second thing I do is agree with half of what they say. I have a lot of friends. I mean, I, when I, you know, not just Arab friends. I have a friend, a Druze friend, who was my platoon commander in my infantry battalion, in my military service, who said to me that when he left the army, he can't get a building permit uh, to build a home because it's very hard for a Druze village to get zoning permits, whereas it's easier for me living in a Jewish city to get zoning permits. A lot of that is not necessarily Jewish Druze, but a lot of that is neglect. And a lot of that is all kinds of things that play into the sense among Israel's minorities that there is a long way to go. I agree that there's a long way to go. Um, so I, I, I respect it. That's the first answer. The second answer is, if you come to me and say to me, I don't get to exist if I misbehave, I then walk away from the conversation. So my first, first I respect them and then I walk away from the conversation. I don't have a better answer than that. Um, I take very seriously what they say. I'm a little troubled that I have to be very aware of the 100 years of history or the 200 years of history that went into creating their sense of the world, but they don't have any curiosity about mine, where my people come from, what my challenges are. If I pull out of the West Bank tomorrow morning, we have on our hands a bigger war than if I don't. I, I don't know the answer to that. That doesn't mean I stay in the West Bank, but that means that if you want me to do something, you have to explain how that ends up, ends up in a better result than it is today. That's the homework that you, a lot of the critics of Israel don't, don't usually bother doing. I hope that was a coherent answer. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very, very, once again, uh, concise, insightful, thoughtful. I think you highlight the psychological mechanisms at play that create the rift between the two populations. I think you also did a great job of highlighting, frankly, a, a double standard that some people uh, apply when it comes to Israel, because no other country, it seems, uh, has it, its right to exist is questioned if it, if it misbehaves, or its right to continue its existence is, is questioned if it misbehaves. Right. So, yeah. I, I, think, I think that a, a lot of it, it's, they don't notice that they do this. I think a lot of it is that we are a, a canvas on which they sort of paint their moral story. They don't think of us as actual people. As, you know, we have 2 million school children. We, we live in 79 cities. Uh, all, all the school kids all have to go to, I guess it would be day camp uh, tomorrow morning. We, we speak a language spoken nowhere else in the world. We have our own cinema. We have our own culture. We're a nation. We're, we're not a political story you get to tell yourself about yourself. And people are very, very invested in the political story they tell about us, which is really about them. And so they don't listen to us. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a double standard, but it, it's, not, it's not even that they intentionally have a double standard or a prejudice. It's just a blindness. It's, it's, they're so busy talking about us as something that, that as, as sort of a, a cartoon running in their heads, then that they can't take a, a second step out of their heads and look at us in our terms and, and, and with our experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important point to make. Um, I want to get to more questions uh, for everyone in the audience, for the, the over 100 people who are in the audience. We have lots of great questions rolling in, um, and we're probably going to do questions for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes or so. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to get to everything. But thank you, everyone, for listening and, and being with us and for asking all your questions anyway. And I'm going to try to get to what I can. So um, this is a, an interesting question. Here, um, coming in from Elias Del Rosario, if I butcher some people's names, I apologize for that. Um, but Elias says, um, I enjoyed the brief summary of Israel's political history. Um, can you discuss what type of government was in place that pushed forth the current status of Gaza? You touched on that a little bit, um, but here's the kind of more different part of the question that we haven't touched on yet. Um, do you believe a similar government could do the same in the West Bank? I know sometimes it's hard to answer what if questions because the, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, but you know, I'm gonna ask anyway, do you think that uh, that withdrawal again? 
Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a question that um, consumes no small amount of our policy planning elites, you know, uh, attention. Um, the, the simple answer is uh, that a unilateral withdrawal that looks like Gaza, which is to say we literally, what Olmed ran on in 2006, uh, which is to say we pull out, we pull out of 90%, 95%. You know, if we're pulling out unilaterally, we don't ask for the Palestinians, we take whatever we want. Uh, again, not me, it's an Israeli government, what it wants, but obviously within Israel, there are many different views of where the border should go. Uh, but nevertheless, that government carrying it out goes to, it goes to whatever border it wants and you know, builds a wall and, 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 and holds the line. Um, that policy, which won the election in 2006, um, cannot happen again, not for the foreseeable future, no matter who the government is, uh, for the simple reason that Gaza went so terribly badly. Uh, we pull out in August of 2005. People don't remember because they're so used to Gaza being under under blockade. Uh, but the blockade didn't begin in 2005, and it didn't begin in 2006 with Gilad Shalit and with the war. The blockade began in 2007 when Hamas carried out a violent coup, not against Israel, against the Palestinian Authority, and took over the Gaza Strip, and essentially has spent the last 13 years turning Gaza into a uh, military uh, into a military fortress. Um, uh, everyone complains about uh, the Israeli blockade. Um, and because of Israel complaining a lot about people complaining about an Israeli blockade, people now mention the Egyptian blockade. There is, of course, an Egyptian blockade. But the Egyptian blockade came from somewhere as well. It begins in 2014 when Hamas decided that it has one last open border. Gazans are terribly suffering under its rule. So the best thing to do is to step into the Egyptian civil war on the side of the Muslim Brotherhood in the civil war in Egypt between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Egyptian army and to uh, fight on one side of the war of the other country with which it has a border. The army wins that particular civil war in Egypt and seals the border as punishment to Hamas. Uh, and since 2014, Gaza really is uh, in a humanitarian uh, crisis. Uh, until then, you could get, you know, it, it wasn't that the economy was doing great, but there was an open border and you could get in and out of Gaza pretty easily. And you could uh, get KFC in Gaza, in fact, because you could order it from El Arish. Um, and uh, you, you can't do that since 2014. In other words, the scale of Hamas's betrayal of Gaza is really astounding. And one of the interesting things about the polls in the West Bank where Hamas wins every poll is that polls done in Gaza, Hamas usually loses, uh, which is a very humanizing factoid about Palestinians. They, they are aware that they are not being well served by their leadership, regardless of what you think of the terrible Israelis. Um, so we can't pull out of the West Bank because Hamas will win the election and the civil war, internal Palestinian civil war for the West Bank. And that's guaranteed. And that's something that Fatah knows. Uh, and, and until someone knows a way around that, until someone has a good idea of how to get around that, that's simply off the table. So going off of that, uh, I think I think this is a good question to explore next. Uh, this question was forwarded to me. I'm not sure who asked it, so I apologize. But the question is, is there any kind of partner, maybe a more liberal faction that we don't really know about or don't really talk about, amongst the Palestinians who would be willing to make good faith efforts at peace with Israel? Um, th there are two answers. The simple answer is no. Uh, Hamas and Fatah are very well armed and suck all the air out of the room. Um, if they let you live, if Hamas allows someone else to exist in Gaza, it's because it's convenient to do so, not because it's uh, they can't, you know. Um, uh, so the simple answer is no, there isn't. Uh, there, there are a few very small parties. Salam Fayyad's party is an example, the Palestinian, uh, foreign Palestinian prime minister who is also a World Bank economist and has a PhD from the University of Texas and is someone who Israel had high hopes for putting a little order into the West Bank. His efforts as prime minister to bring reform to end corruption, to begin serious um, negotiations with Israel were undermined by uh, Abbas. Uh, and uh, and uh, who didn't want a third power to really succeed. Um, so the simple answer is no. There is something else happening among the Palestinians. I want to first, just with a caveat, I'm not Palestinian, I'm Israeli. Uh, understand that you're hearing an Israeli view of Palestinians and not an objective set. You know, I just, I don't, 
I don't know that society from the inside. I know them from being their next door neighbor. Um, but uh, there is a deep, deep sense among Palestinians that, uh, that the national movement has failed them, that Fatah and Hamas have failed them profoundly. You could blame the Israelis for everything and you still have a plenty of blame left over for, for their own leadership. Uh, and we have that in polls, we see it in polls. Um, they're, they, there, this, there was a, a few years ago, uh, 2015 or so, uh, there was this wave of stabbing attacks by young Palestinians that were sharing the attacks on social media, and it, and, and it was something pretty horrifying uh, to Israelis. But what was really fascinating to me was, was following uh, the Palestinian discussion of those attacks, because the, the attackers couched their attacks as a rebellion, not against the Israelis, of course, it's a rebellion against the Israelis, but it's a rebellion against Fatah and Hamas who had led them into this dead end and had led them into this place where they can't get peace with Israel. They can't get, you know, win a war with Israel. Um, uh, they, can't, they can't even uh, have a sense that their national movement is going somewhere that they can, that they can in any way um, um, have a better future for themselves. It was a rebellion against their own national movement, having nothing to tell them, having no more solutions to give them. Um, and and that's, that's happening. In other words, this Palestinian sense of we, we don't have a future anymore or agency and ability to give ourselves a better future because our leadership has failed us so much in facing you know, our Israeli enemy. Um, but deeply, deeply also, uh, you know, our, our, our leadership has failed us, uh, is real and is powerful. So maybe when Abbas uh, passes away, he's quite old, he's in his mid 80s, uh, when, maybe when he passes away, then we'll begin to see an opening of a new kind of, um, a new kind of Palestinian discussion and search for answers. Some of it will be worse, will be more violent, some of it hopefully will not. So speaking of the Palestinian leadership, we have a question coming in from Jennifer. Jennifer, I don't know your last name, I'm sorry. Um, but as another side note, this is gonna be the last question, guys. I apologize. I know there are tons of questions flowing in, um, but thank you all for participating anyway. Um, so this question from Jennifer is, speaking of the Palestinian leadership, can you talk about differences between Hamas and Fatah? I'm sure there could be a whole lecture on that topic, but in the few minutes we have left. Yeah, let me say something important about that difference. The Palestinian conflict, um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict takes place in a regional reality that is much larger than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There, the, way, the way the Israeli sort of strategic planning elite thinks about the region explains, I think, certainly to viewers from abroad who are used to more of the journalistic sort of shorthand of how this region looks, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Israel. Um, the way Israeli strategic planners think of the region is that it's divided into um, essentially four axes. And those four axes are, you've all heard of them, but they are the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood axis. That is the Muslim Brotherhood organization in Egypt and the ideological um, effect it has had on the regime in Qatar, on the regime in Ankara and Turkey. Um, and of course, Hamas, which is almost a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, it's deeply, deeply connected to the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and it has not only a vision for the future of the Middle East and the Muslim world, but it in fact uh, supports each other. In other words, Turkey supports those groups in Syria, in the Syrian conflict that have that ideology, spends money on Hamas. Qatar funds Hamas. Qatar and Turkey together uh, you know, act in the region. Turkey and Libya, or at least that branch of Libya, act together in the region. If you understand that there is this Muslim Brotherhood axis, you suddenly see uh, a whole lot of regional dynamics. There is a second uh, axis, which is the conservative Sunni states. The media sometimes calls them moderate. I don't know that Saudi Arabia is more moderate than Turkey, but, um, but they are the conservative states. A lot of them are monarchies. Um, a lot of that Jordan, uh, you know, the Egyptian army, uh, Morocco, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, um, with the obviously major exception of Qatar. Um, and these conservative Sunni regimes see both the Muslim Brotherhood revolutionaries as enemies, and they also see the Shiite axis, which is the third axis, as their most profound enemies. Um, the, um, 
The third axis is Iran, the Shiites, and that includes the Hezbollah in South Lebanon, the Shiites of Lebanon, which are a double digit, I don't know, I think they're half the population of Lebanon, something like that. Of course, just look it up on Wikipedia, the exact numbers, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they're a vast part of the Lebanese population. The Alawites, which are an offshoot of Shiite Islam, which is the Assad regime in Syria. The Hezbollah Iran support for um, the Assad regime makes sense if you see the Shiite axis. It's the same with the Houthis in Yemen who are part of that axis. Uh, and then there's the fourth axis, which is, I don't know what to call it, the non-Muslims, although it includes, it's Israel, uh, lots of the Druze, um, the Kurds uh, who are Muslim, but not Arab. So um, just like we're honorary, uh, <laughs> um, I guess they're honorary members of this uh, of this uh, axis. There are these four different axes. Now, if you understand Iraq as a state in the European sense, nothing that happens there makes sense. But if you understand Iraq as an arena in which these three axes intersect and fight for dominance, the Shiites, the Sunnis, the more Islamist Sunnis of Muslim Brotherhood or even further of the Al-Qaeda, if you begin to see the axes in operation, suddenly everything happening in Iraq makes sense. And the Israeli, who is allied, allied with Israel and who isn't, the fact that Jordan is essentially an Israeli military protectorate, the fact that Saudi Arabia and Israel are profoundly um, uh, uh, closely working together against the Shiite axis all over the region uh, suddenly makes a lot of sense. So. Um, I say all of that, the question was, what's the difference between Fatah and Hamas? The most important difference between Fatah and Hamas is not the story they tell about the Palestinian national movement. The most important difference is that Hamas belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood axis and receives massive support from Qatar, from Turkey, it tries to dominate Palestinian politics with their help and with their narrative of Islam and of what to do about Israel. And then there is the Fatah side, which is part of the conservative uh, Sunni axis, uh, which receives their help, their support, uh, and tries to dominate the Palestinian arena uh, with their narrative. And so the Palestinians are divided, or an arena like Iraq, like Syria, in which the whole regional dynamic splits them apart. So when I, when you know, when I, when Israelis complain that the Palestinians are divided. Uh, that's not a small thing. And it's not something the Palestinians themselves can easily, there's so much Qatari money and, and Turkish support on the Temple Mount, among the extremist groups on the Temple Mount, looking for a fight and violence on the Temple Mount in order to inspire more Muslim Brotherhood you know, uh, uh, regimes around the region, um, that the Fatah, the conservative Sunni side, is having a lot of trouble pushing back against. Um, the, it, it's a profound divide that's dividing Palestinian society, and the entire region is invested in the divide. And in a way, Palestinians and Israelis have been the most helpless in, um, in, uh, in pushing back against the Palestinians dividing along the deeper lines of the region. Uh, so that's the most important strategically, I think, reason uh, difference between Hamas and Fatah. Cool. Well, thank you, Khabib. Uh, yeah, with so much going on and such a, uh, you know, such a crazy part of the world sometimes, it, you know, it, it's definitely very useful to hear a con concise analysis again to kind of make sense of it all. So thank you. Um, unfortunately, everybody, that's about all the time uh, that we have today. Um, I wish I could get to all the questions, um, but I just want to say again, thank you to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for putting this on. This has been a, a great event and judging from all of the uh, thank yous, I love this that I'm seeing in the chat on the side of my screen here. I think other people feel the same. Um, for me, uh, personally, it's been a real pleasure to be involved with this and to moderate the discussion. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining in. Thank you, Javiv. Thank you. To thank the you so much. Thank, thank you, the foreign ministry, and thank you to everybody who came. Yeah, absolutely. I second that. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.